Hi everybody, I'm Melissa and I'm here with Liz Heller who is the artist behind Mod Ceramics. We're here in Aspen, Colorado. I met her at the farmer's market here in Aspen that happens every Saturday and I absolutely fell in love with her work. And you know that I love ceramics. You know I'm passionate about that. We've talked about that before. So I'm super thrilled to be here in her studio at the Red Brick Center for the Arts. And it's a really <laughs> cool place. Uh, we're going to do a little tour of the center and then we're going to really uh, look at how she uh, creates her inspiration, how she got started, all those things that we want to learn about uh, from an artist and we'll get to, get to see her work. So here we go. So here we are, Liz Heller, in her studio, and we're going to talk all about her process and how she got to live in Aspen, Colorado, doing artwork. <laughs> Amazing. Anyway, Liz, talk to us about your process, what you're creating, and then a little bit about how you came to start you know, being a ceramic artist. Okay. I, um, well, I have a degree in sculpture, actually, and um, this was never the plan to make ceramics in a small mountain town. It was never the plan. Um, so I started, I learned this process in graduate school. I took a three-week summer workshop um, right as my time in Madison, Wisconsin was ending, and I fell in love with it. Um, there's so much you can do the possibilities are endless with this process and I think um, that's why I fell in love with it initially and then um, I did a residency at Anderson Ranch in the fall of 2014 so okay. I graduated let me interrupt you for a second Anderson Ranch is an art school it's a facility internationally renowned art center in Snowmass, which is adjacent to Aspen, and it's an amazing place. If you're ever in the area, you must go see it. It is a fabulous resource for artists and the community. We're so lucky to have it in our tiny little yeah. valley. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah. So I was there for a 10-week artist residency in the fall of 2014, and that's where I, I learned how to 3D model in the computer and 3D print objects. So this one was actually modeled and printed in 2014 uh, at Anderson Ranch. Um, and this is one of my uh, vases. And it started off as a sculpture and then I started making functional work out of this. And then I've been making functional work ever since. Awesome. So I wanna just back up a little bit. So what I find really fascinating about her work is that, you know, when we think of clay, we think of, you know, throwing on a wheel or hand building, that kind of a thing. Um, and when you think about molded things, you think about what you find in like Pottery Barn or something like that. But she's added an element to it that is very unique and artistic. Um, so by 3D printing, which in itself is a whole other aspect and you don't normally see artists that can that can blend like a techie thing like 3d printing because you have to do that on a computer and then taking that and then translating that into the ceramic arts I think is really special and unique and so she's going to talk a little bit more about the process and we're going to see we won't see the 3d printing part but we will see the other part of what she does here. So carry on. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so the, the 3D printing part is, is probably the most difficult for me. I'm an analog person and I like to get my hands dirty. So it's, it's, my, it's kind of like 
as far as the process goes, it's the necessary evil part of the process. Um, but it's also the best way that I can get what's in my head into a three-dimensional object. I mean, it really is, you know, they call it rapid prototyping and that is exactly what it is. Um, so it's a great way to get what's in your head into the computer and then out into the world as a, as a physical object. Um, but I don't love how the physical objects turn out and come out of the printer. Otherwise, it would be so easy to just um, introduce these to the public. Um, and I think ceramic and porcelain, I use porcelain as such a beautiful material. So what I do after I get the print is I'll make a plaster mold of it. Um, so these are some molds right here. And um, I'll actually open this one up so you can see what the interior looks like. Um, so you pour plaster around it, basically. Um, and then you can take the original plastic piece out. Um, and then it creates this. Here, let's see this so they can, I don't know if you could really see all the facets no. um, of that 3D printed vase that she just showed you. Um, yeah, it's a similar design. So it's basically, you have the cavity. You're producing the cavity um, of what you're, you're going to cast into. So the next part of the process is called slip casting. And it's actually, it's an industrial process. It's how Kohler makes your toilets and sinks. Um, and basically what happens is you pour a liquid clay that we call slip into the mold and the plaster will drain, it'll drink the water out of the slip and form a shell. So I can actually show you the shell. Very cool. Um, let's see. I don't want to open this. Let, let me know if I can help you with something. Okay. I think I can normally do this on a flat table. So let's see how that worked. <gasps> So this is how it comes out. That's beautiful. I love that color. Wow. And you can control the thickness by the time you mm -hmm. leave the, the slip in the mold, which is a nice Wait, variable. So we got to see the finished product, well, almost finished product of, the, of her mold, but now we're going to watch Liz actually for the mold, okay? And this is the slip that she was talking about that she uses, that is a special kind of a slip, right? It is, it's, um, a lot of people will ask me if they can just mix water in with regular bagged clay, and the answer to that is no. Um, this is a special formula of slip, a special formula of clay that um, is a mixture of dry materials and with a thing called deflocculant. And the deflocculant is what keeps all of the dry particles in suspension. So if you did make slip in, with a bagged clay, all the solid particles would what we call deadpan in the bucket. Yeah. And you would get this solid. <laughs> material in the bottom of the bucket, but deflocculant keeps the um, solid particles in suspension. Uh, so it's more, it feels like a pancake batter mixture um, at all times. And then, oops. <laughs> almost, almost ran over. That's okay. <laughs> um, it's amazing. And already like this first one that she poured it, go, it went a little over the lip of the mold and the, the plaster is so absorbent of the liquid that it's already like even with the top of the mold. Very interesting. Yeah, it, it shrinks. It shrinks in the mold um, because when clay dries, it shrinks. So that's mm -hmm. basically what's happening here. The clay is is literally drying inside the mold from the outside in and forming a shell. 
Okay, so my question is when, um, for those people who are ceramic artists and they work in clay, mm -hmm. um, you know, when you build something in clay and you put in the kiln and it comes out and you're like, whoa, wait a second, that's like way smaller than, <laughs> you know, what I thought it was gonna be. So it, do you get a lot of shrinkage when you fire or? Yes, that's a really great question actually. Um, because slip is 40% water, mm -hmm. we get way more shrinkage than a thrower would get. So my clay oh, shrinks wow. about 17%. Um, so actually, this is a great visual. If you want to hold the 3D print, okay, yeah, which is yeah. the size of what the model, the mold is, and then this Whoa. is actually how it comes out. So it's a pretty big difference. Yeah. Yeah. How do you get? How do you judge like how big to make something? Like? Well, so I just actually did a, a prototype proposal for a new hotel going up um, and this is one of the models so they gave me their their dimensions their finished dimensions closer so we can see you <laughs> <laughs> and um, and I basically just increased everything by 17% in the computer and printed it 17% larger mm -hmm. in anticipation that it's gonna shrink exactly the way I want it to <laughs> And hit their and hit yeah. their numbers. So okay, and what are you making for this hotel that we don't know? What well, so this is a wall sconce. Um, oh. This ended up not being one of the models that I used. Um, this one did. So you're weird making looking. ceramic wall sconces? Yeah. So their their idea that. was um, a ceramic wall sconce with a lampshade which is very i've never seen it before they had um they had they gave us a lot of um informational uh like inspirational images and what they were looking for and so putting our i think they uh asked a few different artists to submit prototypes for it which was really exciting i've never done anything like that before and so i'm waiting to hear so i won't hear until august um, but fingers crossed. Okay, so just so you know, this whole time that we've been standing here talking, she's adding clay because it, it keeps shrinking into the mold and you don't want it to, you know, it has to be true to dimension. Of right. What you're trying to create. What, so a lot of mold makers and slip casters will actually build an additional part of the mold um, that serves as a reservoir so that you can just do one pour, walk away, let your timer go, which I totally forgot to set. Um, and I'll set that. Um, but for me, I don't, one, it's more time consuming to make the extra mold part. And two, it produces a lot more slip waste. We can reclaim it and recycle it later, but I like to keep as much of the slip in the bucket as possible so that I can keep using it as long as possible. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't use reservoirs, so I do have to keep topping off my molds because it does shrink from the outside in and goes lower. And the danger of not topping off is that you'll have, the top of your piece will be thinner than the rest of your piece. Oh. And that could result in warping and cracking. And so that could be a, a, a structural issue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. And how long, I mean, how do you know how long to leave it in the mold? That's <laughs> also a really good question. Um, so you kind of have to see, it really it depends on the type of slip you're using, it depends on how dry your plaster is, it depends on how thick your plaster is. Um, so for my bigger pieces, like pieces like this big, um, I'll leave in there for 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, for something like this, which is a functional bowl that I know she's going to be eating her breakfast out of, I'll cast it for 20 minutes because I want it to be, I don't want it to be really thin and fragile. I want it to be substantial. Um, for these pieces, I typically do something like this, maybe 20, 25 minutes. This is going to be a two color um, casting, so it's time to pour this out actually. Um, 
And then for a cup like these, probably more like a 12 minute. Um, my slip actually casts really fast mm. because the, the, part, the ingredients I use, they have larger particle sizes. And so it um, casts faster in the mold than um, some other slips that I've used. Do you make your own slips? I do. Okay. I do. I'm really lucky that I can, um, I teach at a community college here and they have a nice uh, 30 gallon slip mixer that I can use. And then um, I'm just gonna turn this over. Okay, we're gonna watch her do this, pouring it. So draining the excess slip so that I just have the shell. And then for this piece in particular, I'm going to cast a second color inside this blue. Mm. Um, so when it comes order. out, the outside will be this kind of a putty color. Yeah. And the inside will be blue and it's all matte. You don't really, you're not, are you going to glaze? I have it? to glaze the inside oh, right. so that it's water, it's watertight. Mm -hmm. And I wish I had a sample of what this is going to look like, but I don't. Um, well, it's well, one be of these this, cups. It will yeah. be this blue on the inside. Okay, let's show that. So this is the color blue that's going to be on the inside. And then that kind of putty color will be on the... There you go. Yeah. Yeah, this is beautiful. By the way, I just want you to see this. It's like faceted. And then the inside is a beautiful glaze, sort of a dus dusky pink. Um, but it's a really beautiful piece. Mm -hmm. And of course, this is one of my favorites that she does. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm going to have her talk about the way she creates this design because it's very unique. Um, the process is quite time consuming. Um, so, please share. <laughs> so, I have a. Um, I guess a product line. I don't know. That sounds so businessy, but um, a body of work. That sounds That's way it. more body my style. <laughs> um, I have a body of work of cups that have text on them or imagery, um, and the way I make those is first I will laser etch the design in a piece of wood, and then I'll roll out a slab, push the slab into the design on the wood and then wrap it around a cylinder and make a mold of it that way. Um, and then that makes, makes it so that the text is actually a positive um, on the cup, but a negative in the mold. So I can do things like add color into the mold just where the, the design or the text is, um, and then pour a different color into the mold after the color color for the text is added um, I'm gonna show one. and get a lot of different variety of, of color and texture in one piece. So kind of like that. This is sort of 3D, those numbers that you see uh, is 3D, but this is all cast in one piece. Correct. All right. And FYI, this girl <laughs> over here is a triathlete. Can you believe it? So she does a lot of work that is geared towards, you know, triathletes and, you know, athletic type people. So. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so let me um, ask you, all right, are you going to, I don't want to mess up your time. So yet. this one's got about 12 minutes left. Okay. This one I should check and see where we're at. I think I still want Maybe so let's down. wait and let's shift gears here a little bit because I want to learn a little bit more about you. Mm -hmm. So just so you know, we're both, I can't believe it, she's <laughs> from, she grew up in Miami and of course I live in Miami and that's where I'm from and she grew up in Miami. It's like so crazy. Crazy. But, and it's an amazing coincidence. So, uh, so you, how did you like, how did art happen for you? Um, well, it was not, 
it was not an obvious choice for me. So I went to college in Memphis and I actually got a business degree. Um, I thought it was the best chance I had of getting a job out of college and that was really, you know, the only thing we were taught to think about at the time. And um, so I ended up moving to Detroit after college for a boy. We always know we do that, <laughs> girls, always. I've done that before. <laughs> um, you know, those kinds of decisions you make when you're 21 and you would never make again in your life. Um, and uh, I was working in the automotive industry in marketing in a cubicle. And um, it was fine. You know, mm -hmm. it was what I just assumed life was working nine to five and sure. doing something that you weren't terribly interested in, but you were getting a paycheck and it was fine. Paychecks um, are good. Paychecks are good. I miss paychecks. Yeah, yeah. When you're an entrepreneur, <laughs> paychecks are kind of a big deal. Yes, okay. yeah. Um, and then pa I... Paychecks validate what you're doing. It's, it's really, you know, having um, reliable income. Yeah is not something to laugh at. I will say that. Um, now that I've been on my own for quite some time. Um, but anyway, I, we digress. <laughs> anyway. Yes. Um, so I ended up transferring to our Chicago office. Mm -hmm. um, and I was so inspired by Chicago mm -hmm. and the energy of the city and the architecture was beautiful and the lake was beautiful. Mm -hmm. and. There's art everywhere. And and I was like, when did I stop painting or drawing or making, I was always taking art classes and I always really enjoyed it, but I didn't really think that that was a viable option for me. Mm -hmm. um, so I started taking night classes while I was working and eventually I quit my job and went back to school and got a second bachelor's in fine art and then and what did your parents say when all this is going on 100 percent supportive awesome i mean they awesome. are very practical yeah but and and we are very different yeah um yeah. but they have always been 100 percent supportive awesome. of what i'm doing mm -hmm. and i mean they don't love that i'm so far away from home but sure. they support it and they're still in florida they're still right? in florida yeah yeah, yeah. So. so yeah without them i mean it would have been a lot harder to make sure. these kinds of choices. So did you do ceramics while you were in like high school or? Not really, I never to... really did ceramics. Mm -hmm. um, I, I learned it in graduate school. Mm -hmm. So I um, got my BFA and then I took a year off and I applied to 13 graduate schools because um, I knew what I wanted to do um, and I knew when I wanted to do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I got into two out of the 13, I got into the number two school in the country, which was back in Michigan, and then I got into the University of Wisconsin in Madison, mm -hmm. and I toured both, and um, Wisconsin was definitely 100% the right choice for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I went there, it was a three-year program, it was like the greatest three years ever, where your only job is to make art and talk about it all day, how, every day. <laughs> how delicious is that? Okay, so you started out sculpting then. And when yes. you say sculpting, do you mean like figure sculpting? No, so or? sculpture now is kind of an umbrella category. Basically, it means almost anything in three dimensions. So um, when I w was an undergrad, a lot of what I was doing was, I was mold making, but I was using synthetic materials. So rubbers and resins. Mm -hmm. um, and then I was also making a lot of jewelry and metal smithing, mm -hmm. um, which I teach now. Um, it's kind of my second love. And um, so I, when I got to graduate school, I did all sorts of things. I welded, I did woodworking, I made my MFA thesis show was 30 um, towers of lamp and chandelier parts that I had collected for nine months in the thrift stores in the area. Um, so I was kind of, I mean, I did it, wow. I did it all. I did neon, I blew glass, I did everything I could possibly get my hands wow. on because that was the benefit of going to Wisconsin, that they had everything. So I wanted that's to amazing. do everything. Yeah, that's amazing to be able to have that experience and 
you know, all the multimedia oh. stuff that you were able to it work was amazing. with. Yeah. And you zeroed in on ceramics. I did. I, I really love the process. I was drawn to the process for so many reasons. One, it's a process and I love process. So oh. that in, in and of itself, um, was really part of the draw for me. The other part is ceramics. You can be learning things about ceramics and clay and firing and glazes for your entire life. Mm -hmm. No one ever knows it all. Mm -hmm. So you're, con you're always learning in ceramics. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what's kept me so, um, so focused in this one material for so long because I've never been focused in one material ever. Mm -hmm. um, but I've been doing this now for seven, eight years which is a very long yeah. time for me to be doing this one process. Yeah, that's quite the time. And how did you get the 3D printing? Like, how did you integrate the two? So I actually learned that at Anderson Ranch mm -hmm. when I was a resident there post-grad school. Um, I was in the school So church. prior to that, wait, you, prior to that you were doing all the multimedia stuff. Yeah. And then you went to Anderson Ranch to do sculpting right so I was in the sculpture area and I brought some projects to work on there and then um, one of the interns in the sculpture area was well versed in 3d modeling and 3d printing and I was like oh well I have this this object in my head I would really like to make it and I would like to make it out of clay can you help me model it and and he did and it was this um, and, and this was really the start of everything. I think that's amazing. It's so weird how things yeah. happen. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So, all right. So Anderson Ranch. Anderson and Ranch. And you finished your stay there. Your artist, you were artist in residence. Yes. So yeah. how long were you there? I was there for 10 weeks. Which was, I mean, I can't say enough good things about that experience. The people, the facilities, it was one of, I've done a lot of residencies and that was um, one of the most formative experiences I've ever had. Wow. So, and while we're standing here, this, what you have set up here, mm -hmm. did you develop this setup? Or this, is so this like a normal thing? This is a uh, casting table. Okay. And um, I had it custom made for me in this space. Um, and it's basically, I can take these out if I have a bigger mold that I need to, um, to pour out, or I can put them in if I have little small molds. So it's really, um, really versatile. And I can fit all my five gallon buckets underneath. Um, it's not supposed to be storage, but right now it's storage also. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sometimes. Um, you know. Sometimes. <laughs> you gotta do what you gotta sometimes do. Sometimes you have to do what you have to do. Right. Um, right. And actually, I'm gonna finish casting the double color piece. Oh, okay, good. Let's see that. And then maybe uh, we'll get to see um, the. We'll, we'll get to see her unmold it because I would love to see how that looks. Um, I think the process is amazing and I love your work. So. Thank you. Okay, so now we're pouring the blue and she's going to fill it all the way up to the top. Yeah. There we go. Very cool. And then I'm going to let that sit probably... 12 minutes. Okay. So, okay, so we're at Anderson Ranch mm -hmm. and you're there for, you said, 10 weeks? 10 weeks. 10 yeah. weeks, which is like amazing. And it's and it's beautiful. It's in the mountains of Snowmass and it's like all these different buildings and you when you walk in there, it's like an artist's dream. You yes. can do painting and woodwork and ceramics and 3D printing, computer mm -hmm. imagery, and uh, it, it's it's really, really, really a cool place, it and um, it's wonderful that it exists. 
Um, okay, so getting back, so you did that, did you that. finished the program, and then what happened? Um, you're not gonna expect this. Um, <laughs> then I moved back to Chicago, uh -huh. and I was married at the time, and we split, and then I got hit by a car. Oh my God. I was in a really bad accident. Oh <laughs> um, and actually stayed with my parents in Miami for a few months. Uh, recovering um, and then I had an opportunity in this valley um, down in Carbondale actually mm -hmm. um, to be a resident at their clay center and so I I moved here I, as soon as I was able to I moved here and started that residency and then I was really only supposed to be here for two years that was my plan and then I was gonna go right back to Chicago mm -hmm. And then I've just, I've been here for seven years and I love it. And I don't see myself ever going back to big city living. And yeah. it's just such a magical place. <laughs> I, I understand that totally. Aspen is really a very special place. Just everything about it, the surroundings, the mountains, the people, mm -hmm. the little town and the history is just really cool. So, okay, that's the timer for... That's the timer for the blue, and I'm actually going to drain that right into the bucket. Okay. Um, not into the... Let me know if I can help you with something. Okay. Um, so we're not seeing this, but she's got sort of like one of those home decor buckets that's full of that blue slip paint that she's pouring into so that she doesn't mix it with the other slip that she poured out of the mold that we just, that she just poured out. Right, so can't mix the colors. Can't mix colors, <laughs> not, not a good thing. Okay, so you went to Carbondale and then here, and then and here we are, and, and, here and we you are. live now in? I live in Woody Creek now. Woody Creek, Woody Creek if, is famous for Hunter Thompson, <laughs> like, you know, but it's, it, everything is all adjacent. So when she says down Valley, Carbondale is just sort of like, what, 45 minutes down mm -hmm. the road, something like that. Another cute little town, but it's not Aspen. <laughs> so Liz, I want to thank you so much for the tour of your studio and to learn about your whole process. Your artwork is beautiful and I love it. It's so original. Um, and if anybody's interested in her pieces, she's Mod Ceramics, and her website is Mod Ceramics. It's M O D C R M X dot com. So mm -hmm. it's M O D C R M X dot com for Mod Ceramics. Liz Heller, the artist. Thank you again. Thank so you so much. much. This was so fun. <laughs> I loved it too. I loved it too.